Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, uh, good afternoon again uh, to all the uh, our esteemed uh, members of the uh, panel who are here already, and uh, to our participants who are uh, I know are still uh, coming in. Uh, it's now uh, three o'clock, so for the purposes of uh, uh, better time uh, management, uh, we will uh, kick it off uh, now, uh, this uh, webinar. Again, thank you uh, so much. Uh, you are all uh, witnessing and participating in this, uh, what we call a secure webinar series three, COVID-19 vaccination program, and how it relates to the entire issue of uh, climate uh, change. Uh, we will run this program uh, for two hours. Uh, hopefully, we will be wrapping up before or just exactly at uh, five o'clock uh, this afternoon. Now, uh, our friend uh, Dr. Dodo Banson in a while will uh, uh, talk about the secure webinar and how it relates to the secure uh, project. But uh, let's see first, uh, just uh, illustrate what will happen this afternoon. Uh, we would want to focus on what are the vital linkages and relationship on how COVID-19 vaccination is being administered to different countries in Southeast Asia. And yet, how it may complement the work on environmental health and to mitigate the impact of uh, climate change, particularly as far as uh, how uh, health is impacted by whatever uh, environmental harm that may be caused by the COVID-19, as well as uh, how it can be also mitigated by the ongoing uh, vaccine uh, campaign. There will be several issues that we will explore uh, this afternoon, including uh, the pandemic and the pandemic of plastic waste that we have seen over the past two years now, uh, aggravated by the extreme use and uh, especially of throwaway or single-use PPE. As well as uh, we will uh, uh, relate how vaccine hesitancy and denial of climate are uh, impacting on sec securing our health and how what can we do together. Uh, and as much as we will throw to the uh, panel the question of can we consider vaccination, um, the massive vaccination campaign going on to uh, address uh, uh, COVID-19 as a climate mitigation or even a climate adaptation uh, measure? If yes, how far can we push it? If no, then how then therefore can we address probably uh, the health impact of vaccination as well to our environment and uh, climate. And for this to happen, uh, we are uh, honored that I, as your uh, uh, moderator for today, my name is Ramon San Pascual. Uh, I, I am helping out the ADB uh, for this particular uh, project, but I'm also representing the Healthcare Without Harm Southeast Asia office as the executive uh, director. Uh, we are happy and uh, excited uh, just to be able to facilitate and be with you throughout this uh, two-hour uh, webinar. 
And there are several panelists uh, in this uh, afternoon. And I will call on them uh, just before I started, just before they make their respective uh, presentation. But as early as now, we are grateful for their uh, important and significant contribution to this, uh, what I would say as a critical question of vaccination and its links to uh, climate uh, change. But before I call on the panelists, I'm uh, happy to acknowledge a uh, dear friend and the one headed, heading this initiative, not only the webinar, but uh, all the work that has to do with SECURE. Dr. Eduardo Banson champions universal health coverage and has long provided technical support to countries in Asia and the Pacific and their pursuit of this uh, uh, goal. Uh, Dodo, as uh, Dr. Banson is known, is a principal health specialist in the Southeast Asia Regional Development uh, of the Asian Development uh, Bank. In, in uh, before 2014, before joining uh, ADB, he was the president and CEO of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, advisor to the World Health Organization for health financing, uh, as well as uh, advising WHO as health economist in, Ban in Bangladesh. And he is indeed a medical uh, uh, professional, uh, health specialist uh, hailing from the University of the Philippines College of Medicine and Ateneo grad, uh, Graduate School of uh, Business. Now, uh, I'm uh, proud at the same time humbled by uh, having uh, Dr. Dodo Banson to just explain to us the context of this webinar within the SECURE uh, project of the uh, ADB. Dr. Dodo, uh please. Uh, thanks, Bon, and uh, Bob, uh, and thanks everyone who's uh, who has joined us in the webinar. Uh, so the Secure TA is a regional TA from the Southeast Asia Regional Department. It is supporting countries, developing member countries in Southeast Asia, uh, and other developing member countries in the rest of uh, uh, who, are, uh, who are of Asian Development Bank uh, implement and uh, COVID nineteen vaccination and develop. Uh, uh, interventions against future health, uh, future disease outbreaks, and probably and any future pandemic. So essentially, what we're trying to do with Secure is uh, is help countries make sure COVID nineteen vaccination, which is ongoing, is done right. At the same time, to learn lessons from uh, from the COVID nineteen vaccination, uh, and to find ways in which we could uh, maximize the value of COVID-19 vaccination and other future interventions against the uh, pandemic. And so this is how we started to have this uh, webinar as a sharing, as a mechanism for countries to share their experiences and not just countries, but also for experts and to explore and do deep deep dives in certain areas. And, uh, and in this for this webinar, we're gonna look into uh, the relationship of climate change with vaccination and in a sense much more broader as what uh, was said, uh, health and climate change. So. Uh, I'm excited as everyone to listen to this presentation. And Mon, I back the floor to you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Dodo Banston. Uh, without uh, further uh, ado, we will now move forward to the uh, uh, panelists. And I'm uh, happy that uh, in this program, we will have four topics uh, to be presented by a series of uh, expert uh, uh, panelists. On the, on the, just to mention the range of, of uh, subject matters we will be discussing this afternoon, it will be kicked off uh, by uh, an expert, uh, one on the topic of environmental and climate impact of the pandemic and how the vaccination is placed in the entire uh, climate environmental impact in impacting health and re related to the uh, pandemic. That's one topic. We will have another one on obtaining health security uh, amidst a pandemic and uh, climate change. And then uh, we, have, we are attending two crises right now. One is climate crisis as a health crisis. 
And of course, COVID-19 as an extremely difficult to manage public health uh, crisis. And uh, how are they uh, related as far as climate action coming up from the healthcare sector is concerned? That's another topic. And then how do we communicate effectively when there is a quite a strong resistance, especially at the beginning against the vaccine, and even denial up to now uh, that climate change is uh, real. So for the first topic uh, on the um, environmental and climate impact of the uh, pandemic, I am uh, happy to uh, introduce to you Dr. Uh, Glenn Paraso, uh, who is the uh, administrator CEO at the Mary Johnston uh, Hospital. And I can proudly say that uh, as a climate champion, he served in the Climate Change Commission in the Philippines as an, as an advisor uh, to health. And as a green uh, hospital uh, champion, he is among the most prominent uh, leaders uh, in the Southeast Asia within the network of uh, global green and healthy hospital uh, being uh, managed by the Healthcare Without Harm. And as a climate uh, champion, and he can tell you a lot about this, he initiated within his hospital several programs and initiatives and projects just to mitigate the impact of climate uh, by reducing their own carbon footprint as a hospital, but also to build resilience in the healthcare uh, setting. How did they fare during the entire pandemic? And what's the role of the Mary Johnson Hospital as provided under the leadership of Dr. Glenn Plasso? I'll call on him now. My dear friend, uh, Dr. Glenn, please. Your mic is not working. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Is this working now? Yeah, and if you can uh, speak uh, louder, please. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. soft. Um, I'll try to speak louder and uh, adjust the volume also. So uh, is this better now? Yeah, we can, uh, we can uh, hear you, and I hope it's uh, louder. Go ahead. Right. Uh, Doc, uh, Mon and everybody, I'll be sharing my screen, and we'll be uh, taking it from here, OK? So uh, as he was saying, um, the title that was given to me is the environmental impact of climate change and health and how, how does the um, vaccine fare as of this time? Uh, I'd like to tell you that among the key environmental and climate issues that emerged during the pandemic is the proliferation of uh, plastic waste. Are, are you is... able to share your screen now, Dr. Glenn? I don't think it's uh, up. Oh, hold on, please. Huh? Is it all right, uh, Doc Glenn? Uh, is it being uh, uploaded now? Or we can also uh, share it uh, for you. Can you see this now? Ah, it's coming. There, yeah. Uh, and if you can put it in a... Uh, uh, presentation mode it would be better for the for our audience at the moment it is the reverse all right got it go ahead thank you you can start Dr. Len. okay thank you very much
clear now, now we lost your voice yeah can you hear me now now you can hear you okay go ahead uh, yeah. of course this is live so we have a lot of uh, um, challenges uh, when we're doing this all right so uh, uh, the topic given to me was the environmental and climate impact of the pandemic and uh, how the vaccination fares at this point in time. You know that there are environmental and climate issues that have emerged during the pandemic period. And uh, one of them, as Mona is saying, is the proliferation of plastic waste, which is brought about by the use and overuse of disposable protective gears, or what is better known as PPEs. Now, the waste that was generated from gowns, gloves, masks, face shields in the prevention and treatment of COVID-19 and in the conduct of vaccination campaigns have impacted our environment. It has posed a climate threat, as we will explain later, and heightened the health vulnerability of our populations. And these negative effects must be managed through what we call policy interventions and effective programs that can help save lives without necessarily destroying the climate and the natural environment. Now we know that COVID-19 vaccination is the largest immunization campaign to date in the world and uh, billions of people have been vaccinated and more will be targeted in the coming years. You know, the pandemic has not left us and this is expected to further generate then an unprecedented amount of waste. Uh, Doc, let no, your, slide, your slide yeah. is not uh, moving at the moment. Uh, you may be uh, already repairing to your uh, another uh, slide. What we're seeing is the introduction to slide. But, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is still part of that slide. Go ahead. Right. Um, so, uh, vaccination will be more targeted and will be targeted in the coming years. And uh, because of this, a framework for safety processing and disposable hazardous materials should have to come into play. Our outline will look at uh, how we will be able to communicate the significant details on these following points. First is the cost, and then the cost, and then the vaccine itself, and recommendations on how to move forward. Uh, with this uh, topic. Next slide, please. Climate change affects the social and environmental determinants of health. Of course, this includes um, clean air, safe drinking water, sufficient food, and secure shelter. And the direct damage costs to health is estimated to be between two to four billion US dollars per year by 2030. And so areas with weak health infrastructures, mostly in developing countries, developing and develop, um, developing countries like us will be the least able to cope without assistance Okay, without assistance to prepare and respond and reducing emissions of greenhouse gases to better transport, food and energy use gases, uh, energy use choices, I should say, can result in better health, particularly through reduced air pollution among others. That is on the climate change and pandemic side, on the climate change side, I should say. On the pandemic side, the pandemic has likely increased deaths from other causes, not only from COVID-19 itself, due to the disruption of health service delivery and routine immunizations. Fewer people seeking care and shortages of funding from non-COVID-19 services have affected the pandemic itself. And as you can see now, climate change and pandemics are both then health, public health concerns. And there is a direct relationship of pandemics and climate change. And managing one helps manage and mitigate the other. As in our outline, let's look at the first at the cause, uh, looking at COVID-19 and climate change and cross linkages of these. 
you know, there's pandemic in health and then there's climate change in health and the overlaps of pandemic, the pandemic and climate change on health. Just to show you a slide that looks at cases during the timelines, in December of 2019, that's when we started with uh, the coronavirus, formerly known as 2019 and COVID, and now renamed, renamed COVID-19. This had rapidly spread throughout China and went global. In 2020 of January, the first suspected case in the Philippines was investigated and 633 cases were reported as of March 1 after that January appearance. And March 2020 of that year, out of 1,546 confirmed cases during that time, 56% were still under investigation. And it was in the male portion that are in the age of 60 and 69 years, which was the most affected at the time. In September of 2021, after that, earlier on, we can see that uh, Proclamation 922 uh, declared a state of public health emergency throughout the Philippines. And in September of 2021, there was a booming recording of cases of 161,000 and 50% were now both from the male and female with the most, uh, most effective age group of 20 and 29 years old. Fast forward to this year in January, 2022, as of uh, 30 of January, a total of 3.5 million cases in the Philippines have been recorded and uh, with as much as 53,000 more deaths at a 1.6% death rate. And um, since the beginning of this uh, COVID pandemic until now, um, there, there were different waves that were seen and the last was uh, during this January 22, when we were having to observe the Omicron subvariant, which uh, heavily hit the Filipinos, but there were not so much hospitalization during this time. And um, yeah, they were peaking in January and uh, in early January and afterwards, it has now been on the current downward trend. Although as of the, today, there has been reports that we're again on the uptick and uh, NCR is again in the moderate risk category. The next slide will show you our cost outline, which looks at the effects and impacts of uh, both COVID-19 on the left slide and climate change comparatively on the right slide. As you can see, they both have direct and indirect effects and impacts. So uh, while COVID-19 has its overall collateral effects, climate change also has these same effects. And truly they are overlapping in some manner. You know, the health infrastructure in uh, COVID-19 has been overburdened and uh, medicines have been diverted from other causes. Uh, in the Philippines, as we are treating tuberculosis, HIV AIDS and other uh, infectious diseases, a lot of medicines have been diverted and resources even for COVID-19 treatments. Also supply chains for non-COVID-19 medicines have been disrupted and a lot of diseases have been deferred. Uh, this is especially true because uh, in hospitals, we were closing other, you know, other infectious disease treatments and also only focusing on uh, COVID-19 cases. On the right side, um, we are looking at um, climate change and uh, it also has both its direct and indirect effects. The direct effects, of course, we know as having looking at storms, droughts, flooding, and uh, also heat waves. And uh, the indirect effects also being affected with this. And we can see that it has been reported that since the 1800s, global warming has been there. And uh, we have increased by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius as of now. And as climate progresses, temperatures to continue to rise substantially given our extreme weather events, which we're seeing like now. And heat waves are becoming more common and uh, they last longer in the summers. 
you know, the converse is also true. Climate change will also result in shorter snow cover duration and um, on the other side of the globe. Now, um, it is very evident that these changes are happening for the long term. Unless we do something about it, citizens' health and the other harmful impacts can really affect our health both and then also affect and enhance whatever pandemics there are right now or even in the incoming pandemics. Our next slide will show us the cross linkages. So you can see now that even as we look at well-resourced equitable health systems, this will be the ones that will protect us from the coronavirus as much as protect us also from the economics of what's happening. So, it is very essential that we have equitable health systems. Inequality is also a uh, social determinant of health, and it's a major barrier in ensuring the health and well being of people. You know, social and economic inequality materializes in unequal access to health systems. And last but not the least, a long term perspective and a paradigm shift towards global health should be done. We, we, by having this shift, we can manage our risks better and a collective action and effectiveness of this risk management can happen even as we cooperate with each other. So, you know, the cross linkages are there and we should put them forefront in order for us to respond both to climate change and to the pandemic at the same time. Now, counting the cost, from the cause a while ago, we are looking at infection and fatality, mental health, economic impacts, and environmental degradation for the long term. So part of the cause, as we can say, is infection and fatality. Looking at, at it globally as of uh, this uh, month, we already have 537,000 cases confirmed of COVID-19 with 6.3 million deaths, which is uh, equivalent to around 1.6% death rates. And in Southeast Asia, of which we are a part of, there have been 58 million confirmed cases. Uh, in um, um, a published um, report with the DOH, we can see that in the Philippines, as of June, there are 3.6 million cases, of which 60,000 deaths have occurred. Uh, mirroring the global picture of 1.6, 1.7%. So infection and fatality rates, while uh, they are low in deaths, they have really caused a lot of uh, havoc in the other sectors of society. The next slide will uh, show us that uh, there is really a hidden cost to the various uh, um, effects of uh, both climate change and uh, pandemics. It affects people's physical and mental health, both climate change and the pandemic itself. They are interconnected with uh, community health and uh, the vulnerabilities just bring this out as individual and social levels are affected by these. Furthermore, the pandemic and the measures taken to contain it have had a general impact on our mental health. This is the hidden cost, which uh, because of isolation is um, really very stressful. You know, suffering, anguish, anxiety, insomnia. A lot of this even, you know, drug and internet addiction have come before us and increased because of isolation and the lockdowns. We can see here now that Another cause is not only mental health, but also the economic impact. So while we have infections and fatality, mental health, the cost also is looking at the economic impact. So you can see that both are related, that while climate change affects human health and other significant sectors on your left, there is also a lot of loss of income due to premature deaths, right? So the economic impact of both the pandemic and climate change causes serious public health disruptions and the impact to human health and productivity, which negatively also affects sectors such as agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and tourism, 
are really related to each other. Trade and supply chain management is also related. So both mental and economic impacts are related to the cost. This slide will show us that there is a cascade of things that happen with environmental degradation as a cost of both the, of both the pandemic and climate change. You know, drought can harm food production and human health. Flooding can lead to disease spread and damages and human health issues such as increasing mortality, impact on food availability, worker productivity as being limited. These are also some impacts which are seen in every aspect of the world that we are in, whether we're in the developed or developing portion. However, these impacts are unevenly um, seen across the country and across the world. You know, there, because of inequalities and the stand of uh, different developing and developed countries, socioeconomic inequalities can really uh, heighten this environmental degradation and exposure to hazards. So the fewer resources we have, the lesser it is for our hazards to, to increase. Continuing, let me draw your attention to vaccination as a primary resource to the pandemic. You know, um, vaccination, as we were talking about it, is a response to the pandemic and it highlights both its benefits as to the people and economic uh, economies that have been saved, as well as its detrimental cost to population and environmental health. And truly, while we look at uh, vaccination, it has both its implementation uh, changes and effects and its uh, byproducts as a result. This slide shows uh, our first dose coverage completion, uh, which have been done and uh, at 9.4 million doses per day around the world. And at the present rate, it will take eight months just for the first dose coverage. You know, vaccine hesitancy plays a very big hindrance to attaining what uh, our Herd, herd immunity and that this is just the first shot. In the Philippines, where this uh, our dashboard right now, it shows that there have been a total of 152 million doses as of June. And um, of this 152 million doses, 67 are the first dose and 70 million are the second dose. So you can see that uh, booster doses, which uh, are not yet here, uh, look at uh, 14 million that have been uh, given as of this time. In the Philippines, we know that herd immunity is more or less around 75% and with a population of 112 million, that's around 84 million. And as of June 21, we have only gotten 70 million. So we're almost there, but uh, we're still working on it. It will be important for us then to complete our vaccination and achieve herd immunity. But the downside to this implementation, of course, is looking at the gloves, the syringes, you know, the vials, the PPEs that are, uh, that are a result of the medical waste, right? So uh, just to show you, this was a picture that was taken our, in our vaccination here at the Mary Johnson Hospital shows you the amount of uh, PPEs that are going around and the medical waste that are generated by, uh, by this. Our next slide, interestingly, will show us that 140 million test kits worldwide have been shipped. And uh, this has given us uh, 2,600 2, tons of general rubbish and 731 liters of chemical waste. More than 8 billion vaccine doses already have been given, and this has given 10 times increase of uh, healthcare waste load in uh, the different facilities that we have, 8 million of which have been entering the ocean and estimated to have 150 million tons already circulating. So even as we clean up our beaches, a lot of this, uh, you know, um, masks are already around. They're also in the beaches, go to Boracay, you can see them. So uh, really, uh, it's uh, creating havoc both in our environments. Uh, in interestingly, 
an ADB study, which was published in 2021 by the National Center for Biotechnology Innovation, was done with the proposed equation of measuring the weight of total waste as a proxy calculation vaccination expense. And our Department of Health estimates that this composite total cost of vaccination is around 1,300 per person. Therefore, uh, with a proxy of around 91 billion using this, uh, uh, this uh, formula, that's around 91 billion pesos for a complete vaccination of two doses, as we said a while ago. So the vaccination sets, syringe, glass vial, alcohol swabs have been weighted. And uh, this is the estimated generated waste from the vaccine and cost. Moving forward, the pandemic is far from over. Management of risk and cost will matter for both the short and long term. And the following recommendations are put forward to minimize public health disruptions globally and locally. It will be essential to have a global level of cooperation as a strengthening coordination is at the forefront, both for resource generation and waste management. We should take into direct, we should take into consideration both the direct and indirect effects of the pandemic and climate change on public health. Essential policy and leadership should consider also intergeneration effects of this uh, climate change. You know, facilities should also be strategically located, if not more mobile, to increase access and lessen population movement. This will also help in infection control and population movement. Reverse logistics, centralized treatment, and local and regional production should also take into consideration the circular economy, meaning that as a response, we should be maximizing original intent of the products in lifespan of these products and processes as part of our response to both the pandemic and to climate change. Now, as climate change, as climate changes, the tipping point of our irreversibility really models the canvas of what we have as health systems. And conversely, global and systemic preventive responses to pandemics should be the norm as public health or public health is at the crosshairs. Thank you very much. Paraso, uh, thank you so much for that uh, very, uh, I would say, fresh perspective of how COVID vaccination and then the environmental impact uh, and then on climate uh, as well. Uh, I, 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 I would say that uh, even in my own case, this is, a, a, to me, uh, press presentation and um, quite a compelling one. And thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Glenn. And I know there will be questions from our, uh, not only the co-panelists of Dr. Glenn, but much more from the participants. Please note your questions. We will provide you the time to raise them uh, after the uh, pre presentation. Dr. Glenn, please uh, stay around and listen to your colleagues as I uh, call on the next uh, presenter, uh, who would uh, now uh, present to us uh, another dimension of this uh, topic. How do we obtain health security amidst the pandemic and uh, climate uh, change? And uh, for this topic, I'm uh, happy to have Dr. Suherman as the expert uh, presenter he is also a uh, medical uh, doctor, uh, master of uh, public health, and uh, also serving as the uh, South uh, Asia Advisory Council in the uh, Healthcare Without Harm. Uh, he, he's, he has held several positions, uh, both in Indonesia and in the region, but he started the service in, uh, in the Provincial Health Office as the director of a government hospital in Sukabumi in Indonesia. Uh, his experience is coupled with his active membership, participation, and consultancy 
to various organizations including JICA, ARSADA, CityNet Indonesia, and of course, uh, Healthcare Without Harm. At present, Dr. Zerman concentrates on strengthening the health district uh, management and hospital transformation and management while actively pursuing design and change management in various parts of uh, Indonesia. So uh, we're happy to uh, have you, Dr. C. Herman. Uh, please take over. Yeah, thank you, Mon. I think it is my pleasure. Uh, good, afternoon, uh, good afternoon to everyone and also to Mon, who has already facilitated me for speaking in this uh, important seminar, maybe. But I think uh, the topic is quite uh, challenging for us because uh, this is the issue you see about the health security amidst the pandemic and the climate change. I think just based on this uh, topic, I think it is very uh, uh, proxy for us here in Indonesia because I think uh, only a few of uh, our health professional, mostly from the hospital side, talking about uh, this issue very clearly. So based on this, uh, uh, I would like to share. Please continue the uh, uh, next slide, please. If you think about uh, global health security, I think we should remembering about the broad issue inside. The first, I think I'm very pleased to Dr. Glenn who was already uh, explaining about the uh, linkage. But the global health community, government epidemiologists, multilateral organization, technical company by WHO is very important thing to uh, inform about the health country. The second is about the focus on the what matters, fine and the fun rights ideas. This is the uh, some of the difficulties maybe to how to make it integrated in one position. The other issue is about the using tools and data science because we are uh, without the supporting of the data science, we can kind of the global independence of pandemic and prevention. But we are the best uh, insurance. A policy against another pandemic. The fourth issue is about the collaboration in the world of the connected world. We know that intelligence center was already uh, explaining about the uh, genomic and the uh, sequencing, population mobility, public health, and also height map of location and target you know, interface. I think this also should be uh, in our mind about the global health uh, security in our world. Please. Next slide, please. The current situation of Indonesia, it is about the coverage of the vaccination in the uh, line of the border, the first doses and the uh, second doses and also the booster. In case of Indonesia, maybe we have already a lot of uh, data, but maybe have already been collected by the Minister of Health about the situation. But we know that the uh, actor is not only for the health uh, professional itself, but maybe also including about the so many uh, facilitators by the satgas. But in case of situation of Indonesia, we know that maybe it is the doses is about the 96% and the, the second dose is about the 80% and the, for the booster maybe is about the 28%. But now that the situation is not be clear, but we stood uh, in changing about the uh, coverage of this vaccination for the next. Next, please. Please on this uh, experience, I think, we know that the global trusty world is ranking, that we know that the doctor has already successfully and both trustworthy if they talk, if they move and their things and the other thing. But we know that Doctor is very uh, central position in that time because they are not only uh, acting in the preventing and the covering uh, about the COVID, but also the doctor. So many of um doctor as well because uh, attacks by also suffering for the fatality and kids uh, fatality in Indonesia. Maybe for the doctor, midwife, nurse, and also health personnel is quite big. 
So I think, but until now, the doctor is very trustworthy than other uh, professional uh, after the COVID and the vaccination in Indonesia. Next, please. You see the situation of Indonesia, the pandemic condition in Indonesia is still under control. While we know that even through cases increasing, the positive plate is still recovery low at maybe 1.62 until 2.4, at standard below the standard of WHO. The other issue is transmission rate in Indonesia is still low, maybe 1.8 per 100 you know, weeks uh, below the standard of WHO. And there has been no increase in the hospital care of death today. But other than that, maybe epidemic modeling susceptible in person of Java Island until June. We know from the graph, you see, there is the what we call the historical uh, evidence about the COVID in Indonesia. Maybe the original case, uh, better sequencing is about the, uh, but maybe now developed into the second, I see, and the last. But we because nowadays the situation after maybe mostly the seasonal in Indonesia after the maybe uh, farewell and also the national holiday, there is uh, sometime looking the increasing of the number of the new cases. Maybe it's right about uh, six months later and also maybe two months after. This is showing that the situation is not very safe. Like nowadays, maybe in the last of the uh, end of June, maybe we have a suffering for the new sequencing after uh, uh, COVID into the Omicron. And also now it's about the B2 and uh, B4 and B4 is with the new uh, sequencing. So that's why the increasing the number of the case in Indonesia also, not only was the old case, but also it is the most about the finding of the new sequencing like that. So this is the uh, figure of how the uh, level of transmission uh, uh, community double in, uh, in uh, based on the double standard. Maybe the number of cases is uh, 20 cases for 100 uh, patients per week. And also the in-house uh, maybe below than uh, five rate for the 100 patients in weeks. And uh, that rate will be uh, about the not uh, lowering that uh, one uh, death from uh, 100 sustainable in the way. So this figure showing us that we are we're not on the safe, but we stood uh, looking for another uh, preparation about the health resilient and also for the sustainable. Next, please. Next slide, please. So what the next pandemic and when? We know that the pandemic climate of crisis, so many issues about misdiagnosis, misunderstood within community, with but between between all the personal, the government, local government, central government. The other is about the global health emergency. It's not only the pandemic itself, but I can say that is another issue should be uh, protected. Then uh, next is about the how we can also preparing for the global health security, the testing of the parapeta parapetas, resilient, and also government society approach to make a sustainable issue. So if you look at the next pandemic, I think it is very really if, not the bad. Thank you. Please, please, please. Next, please. Next, please. Yes. We would like also to explain, uh, to ex explore about uh, relationship among human rights, environment, pandemic, and climate crisis. We know that maybe reducing the risk of the zoonosis and the expansion of the access, existing factor, it's not so easy. It is, should be looking for the fulfill the rights of the healthy environment. It is about the safe climate. It's about the clean water, sanitation, clean out of the healthy and sustainable food, and also the waste management and healthy ecosystem. The other issue we was also referring about the interaction with the nature. We should maintain and maybe uh, getting about the new paradigm, how we can uh, minimize about the 60% of infection disease and the 70% of the emerging of the infection disease in the human at the same so, Other issue we can also convention about the uh, how the more about the human induced environment changes, modify but they maybe with wipe the population and also about the need of conceptable about the people and the issue and nature. 
The other side is about how to prevent the future um, of the, from the environment uh, degradation. Protecting the host living in the poverty in our subject of discrimination, I think it is also the main issue in still in the developed in other developing country. Mostly in our country, the pandemic and the crisis responsible should address inequitable. Focus of the prevention of the person in the valuable situation, women, children, poor, minority, no one left behind. So it is about the, how the strengthening of the environment rules of law and protected environment human rights defender must should be integrated in uh, one's uh, minds of our uh, concept. Next slide, please. What a policy can do, what policy can do? There is some uh, four maybe agenda about the uh, uh, issue should be can, can protect. The first is about the good air quality. In the good or quality, I think so many parian and so many determinants should be concerned about the uh, condition of the surface and the existing air pollution regulation and doing. The other issue about the ensure the age of companies to continue the development of the planet, developing a better of integrating of the land and use planning because this is of all mostly in uh, outside of Java Island. The clearly communicate, uh, communicable the needs of the ensure proper the ventilated and indoor air quality. Then the other is about the uh, technically is to develop and transplant it and on the on environmental policy in implementing economic and instrumentation of address pollution from mobile and uh, that is very short. Other policy can do is about access to clean water and sanitation. We know that the uh, systematically screen and uh, search information about share copy is the uh, was better before about situation. Provides the access to the trans hygienic infection and hygienic infection. And the other issue is about secure of delivery of the safe and reliable water and also sanitation access to community. It is still below than 30%. And the other issue is about the a longer term of the stimulus package uh, should be considered uh, public to support the investment in the water related infrastructure for developing infrastructure. Next slide, please. The other issue is about the waste management. We know that waste management, Dr. Glenn has already said, is quite complicated, but maybe we should start in the beginning, based on the conceptual, good conceptual, maintenance of the regulation and the recycling measure. Nowadays, we, are, we would like to watch the new tool for accessing how to kill about this one. Another issue, but the, in the longer term, maybe we stimulus package to strengthening the ability of waste management system. It is to address the challenge of the highly contaminated waste. Other issue about the providing guidelines and training to the work, uh, worker involved in the both foreman and informant waste uh, collection and also the uh, mismanagement system. And the last is about the supporting by the effectiveness of managed biomedical and healthcare waste through the appropriate identification, collection, separation, storage, and transformation treatment and the disposal. Other policy about the biodiversity, it is a new issue, but I think uh, only a few of our health facility can do better. Integrates a biodiversity factor in the business and investment decision, including through the responsive supply and chain management. Now we have already improving the third party to fulfill the capacity and the capability to share with this. Mainstreaming the biodiversity into an economic sector and the reform subside to harmful to the biodiversity, including the uh, chorus of the sector, agricultural sector. Other biodiversity action should be is about the scaling up about the policy instrument to create the economics and incentive to the conserve and the sustainable use of diversity such as the forest protection and also the address of the illegal and poorly managed about with wild trade. 
we know that Indonesia nowadays is about the coal problem and also about the uh, distribution and also for the uh, not ship uh, coal factor. And the other is about the support of the ambitious and the effective post 2030 about the global diversity framework and uh, the United Nations Convention on the Biological Diversity. We have already stated in the 2045, maybe we would like to go the golden national uh, achievement with the target, maybe uh, the increasing the number of the uh, emission, not uh, to in terms of about the 1.5 uh, of the uh, 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 one point. Next, please. The COVID pandemic and post pandemic pandemic. We are thinking about the four issues. The first is to better by, uh, to underline about the protects against the threat of the COVID-19. We ensure of the age can be the protection and effective vaccine. Continue vaccination, outreach, and education effort to combat misinformation and disinformation should be occurred until now. Ensure there is enough treatment for based on the guideline by the Minister of Health Standard and maybe also the support by the uh, national uh, insurance. To test to the threat of initiative, until now, maybe for the uh, second episode uh, and this uh, port issue should be uh, increasing. One stop of website allow the easily to find like health guidance based on the carpet trees in the local area and access to be the protected themselves. I think it is also good and important for sure. Increase the manufacturing of COVID tests and the uh, uh, priority protection for immunocompromised and disabilities and the older death. Nowadays, situation of Indonesia, also we have already uh, using the dendritic concept and also to make the, our own uh, vaccine by the, developing the concept from the dendritic into the uh, autoimmune uh, treatment uh, rather than vaccine uh, mission. The second issue is to how to prepare for the new variant. We know that the, now the variant is already going up with the, on the sequencing from the uh, COVID to Delta and also to Omicron and also now to B4 and B5 uh, uh, sequencing. The determinant of the impact of the new variant of our vaccine treatment test and update tool is needed because we know that the, re, the exchange about the variant also uh, decreasing the capacity and capability for the vaccine uh, effectiveness. The third is about the profound economic and education shutdown. We know the give school and business guidance to ensure safer school and workplace is very important, not only for the uh, uh, health uh, intervention itself. Then the board is about continuing to lead the effort of the vaccine people and the safe life. This is the core issue agenda for the how the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and post-pandemic the pandemic. And our question is how the, when the pandemic is to become uh, uh, transition into the endemic. It is our target in the, in the short time. But before that, maybe issue uh, from vaccination program, mostly in the referral system of the hospital, because we know that the vaccination is the main issue from the primary uh, health system services. But the maybe in the time, maybe so many facilities can also supporting for the vaccination program. We find that several issues find within the vaccination program. The first is about the misinformation, disinformation, because uh, not only for the laymen in the uh, grassroots, but also politicians sometimes they deny about the situation. So based on the situation, it's not supporting for the coverage of the vaccination itself. The second is about lack of human resources for mass vaccination at secondary with their facilities, because we should uh, got the, uh, the best coverage with a uh, few of the uh, well-trained uh, vaccinators. So we can uh, enrich and develop, empower so many health professionals, also, also maybe the health practitioner student to also to supporting for the vaccination. Strengthening the rules of the primary health care in the care facility. We know that maybe above then, uh, 88,000 uh, 80, uh, 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 primary health care, not enough uh, to coverage maybe 
about uh, one uh, 280 billion uh, people population in Indonesia. And then about the incentive and collaboration program. Nowadays, the national uh, government support for the giving the incentive to the health professional and other uh, supporting system by the agency in the local, provincial, and the central government to support this. But the collaboration program successfully to, to reach and to cover for the uh, increasing the number of coverage. Issue of vaccination transportation, because it is not only about the cold chain, but also we should bring the cold chain into one island to the one island in the same time, but also in other need supporting for so many vehicles inside. The, uh, the last is about the target of vaccination, how to handle. It is a, a big a problem, it's about the data, because we can sometimes, it is easy to go maybe the under five children, maybe the uh, intermediate school, senior school, but but it is difficult to looking for the private, corporate, and mass vulnerable. Because in the same time, we should coverage all of the uh, population who got the vaccination. It's about the, uh, the last is about the population data. We have sometimes difficulty to get which one who's already been vaccinated and which one while we know it's about a single identity card, but it is still a doubt in the situation. Next slide, please. The transition pandemic to endemic, when is it better? The infection of disease that are not epidemic naturally, naturally, the cross of the intransition to the endemic state or eradication, the transition cure become the virus will eventually run out of the sustainable individual. There is a, a five a prerequisite about the position based on the WHO who got uh, clear and that the pandemic should become uh, trans goes to the endemic. The first is about the transmission rate below the one. The positive rate below the five, hospital rate level before the five, and fertility rate before the three uh, percent, and local transmission level at the one. And also, it should be monitored stable in the uh, with, with maybe in the six months after the first day. So we still uh, requisite about this position to become that is there uh, uh, any possibility uh, not only Indonesia but also uh, around the world in the global can go the maybe uh, transition to pandemic to end. This is one uh, situation needed for the uh, improving the ability and willingness to got the uh, better uh, development of the economic side. There are 10 again factors that lead to a to endemic state. Next year, yes. Current vaccine do not eliminate the risk infection. The immunity both vaccine induced and from invariant again, the sarcopy is reduced. The state is about the high transmission of sarcopy exposition of Omicron variant. But until now, maybe the B4 and B5, it is difficult to go. Current vaccine only reduces uh, virus heading, not process when the body contains viral particles. And the spread of the environment and transmit to other people that does not stop at that transmission. There should be understand about the relative high mutation rate of scarce copy. Maybe now we have identified uh, the same uh, health sequencing like what have already happened, like maybe in the UK, like in the, uh, Europe, and, and also from the other country in Asia about the new variant, which already got, but we know that while the variant is not been uh, separate, separate uh, than uh, like Delta, but maybe it is spread out and the killing about the uh, potential of the vaccination. The issue of the global coordination, Maybe we should uh, increasing the lack of the global coordination for the disease elimination step. We should similar based on the WHO guidelines. Or uh, Suherman, uh, if you can uh, hear me, please. Would yes, you mind uh, ra ra wrapping up the presentation, okay. uh, please? And there are yeah. questions anyway. We will have your last, chance. I think yeah. last month by the presentation. It Thank is you. about issue the uh, next slide, please. The three necessary climate solutions uh, that will create a healthier. We about to clean up the, our energy and electrify everything. And the second about clean up of our atmosphere. And the third is about the, how to make out our community and facility resilient. 
So the, this is the three necessary should be uh, solution for uh, create about the healthier and safer. Next, our summary is uh, the pandemic, the next pandemic of global health emergency is not if, but it is when. The second is about the how to promote the green investment, not only by the government, but also private sector and also the community. The last slide, please. We must go for another, uh, must go for the other to be innovative and also to make a pattern of skill and make solution together for sustainable. And the last is about the transmission of COVID uh, through the endemic state. Uh, continue to lead the effort of the action to vote and save life in the right of step of us. Thank you for the uh, facility of uh, our presentation. The pandemic is not over yet, but don't ignore about this. Sometimes it's better to come again with our preparedness, resilient, sustainable, and also sustainable. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Suhriman, for that very comprehensive uh... Uh, presentation. I am already seeing some questions from our uh, uh, participants and uh, keep on uh, uh, infusing your question to the chat, please, and we will address that uh, later on. And I like, Dr. Thurman, your uh, second to the last slide when you, when you mentioned the need to build resilience in our healthcare facilities, because that is exactly what will be discussed by our uh, next uh, uh, presenter. Uh, and, and yeah, how do we consider vaccination as an adaptation measure or even a climate mitigation uh, measure? And, and, the, and this is through a presentation to be done at the level of hospitals now. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Lee Tai Ha uh, from Vietnam. He is the vice she, she is the vice director of the National Institute of Occupational and Environmental Health in the Ministry of Health in uh, Vietnam, and uh, one which is one of the two collaborating countries of WHO WIPRO in Vietnam. Uh, Dr. Ha uh, is in charge of the WHO. Uh, climate change uh, programming as well as medical testing and environmental analyzing uh, department. She is a doctor, but she has a background on chemistry and environmental uh, science. I can narrate more about her, but I think it's best that uh, we listen to Dr. Ha from the Ministry of Health in uh, Vietnam. Dr. Ha, please. Yeah, thank you for, the, for your introduction, me. Please say my presentation, please. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank for inviting me to here for, um, for present the topic about the healthcare facility resili resilience uh, to plastic waste. I think that is a, a different uh, aspect of the climate change. Because plastic waste also to uh, to very uh, to have a very close contact with uh, with climate change and for the situation of COVID nineteen the rising the plastic waste during the COVID nineteen is also a problem in the uh, uh, in the um, in the environmental next slide please. Uh, the content of my presentation is the impact from COVID-19 and climate change on healthcare facilities. The second one is the situation of plastic waste generation, collection, and treatment in Vietnam uh, in general and during COVID-19. And the last one is the urgent recommendation and action. Next slide, please. Uh, next, please. Uh, we uh, we understand that that the uh, uh, we found the hospital waste uh, represents the bulk of the global discharge, and most of the global discharge is from the Asia. We call for the better. We need for a better management of medical waste in developing country. And for this one, the uh, the waste uh, the, the healthcare facility waste, including the plastic waste, is also a problem. Next slide, please. There is uh, some picture about the typical uh, uh, medical plastic waste 
in the healthcare facilities. You can see uh, many uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, and for COVID-19, many uh, syringe, uh, single use, plastic use, uh, um, many things you can see. And uh, plastic, we, we understand that it's very uh, it's a strong and heavy impact to the uh, to the environment. Next slide, please. Next, please. Yes, that is the uh, fundamental link between climate change and uh, marine plastic pollution. I think we uh, understand it very clear about this one, and I, I want to go to, to pass this uh, slide. Next, please. Uh, that is the uh, impact of climate change on healthcare facilities about dealing with uh, plastic waste. Next, please. Yeah, next, please. Mm, that is the type of plastic waste in healthcare facility. Uh, we divide the infectious uh, plastic waste. Uh, it, it means that it includes some uh, some blood, some uh, uh, some blood or some uh, uh, of the other patient in the healthcare facility or something like this. You can see. And the second one. And the second one is the some hazardous. Uh, we divide the hazardous plastic waste. You can see it's very uh, very popular in the healthcare facility, not only in the uh, in the COVID nineteen uh, situation. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Yes, and that is uh, some ordinary uh, plastic waste. Uh, it means that some uh, single plastic single use. Some, uh, it means that some uh, plastic uh, cup or uh, nylon bag or uh, something like this, uh, something like that. Uh, it's very popular in the healthcare facility. You can see. Next, please. And that is the uh, the table shows the plastic waste generation in healthcare facility in uh, some uh, in some Vietnam uh, healthcare facility in two thousand and twenty. That is a. Uh, that is the in normal um, situation. Uh, we um, we divide in Vietnam. We divide the central hospital, provincial hospital, district hospital, and private hospital. And for this kind of uh, of healthcare facility, uh, the plastic waste we divide for recycle waste, uh, ordinary waste, infectious waste, and non-infectious hazardous waste. And we we can sum the total for this one. And you um, you can see that the highest uh, the, the highest amounts of uh, plastic waste in healthcare facility, of course, in the general uh, central hospital uh, hospital for uh, kilogram per day per better, and the uh, the lattice is uh, for the um, uh, district uh, hospital for uh, general host, uh, district hospital. Uh, and this the number is uh, depend about the bed of the uh, of the um, about the bed and it's the time of the healthcare facility. The next one, yes, the, that is the figure is to uh, to figure out the total amount of plastic waste and be discharged in CDCs and commute uh, healthcare facility. Uh, in Vietnam, we also do have uh, the uh, the CDC. Uh, we have uh, we have CDC that is you can see that is CDC like in uh, in USA or in China. We have a central disease uh, for uh, the CDC. For the, that is also to write uh, to write the number of the plastic waste. But CDC have got a bad. Uh, in patient, we have got a uh, in patient. Uh, in uh, in patient, we uh, we only have uh, our patient, uh, some uh, some staff, and also the uh, for the commute uh, healthcare facility. We also we have got a uh, uh, in patient, only uh, our patient for this one. So the number of the uh, the total amount uh, amount of plastic waste is the reduced one. Next, please. Yeah, that is um, the number, uh, the amount of the plastic waste of the hospital, of the CDC, the communes, the healthcare station, and etc. Next, please. 
the plastic waste collection uh, in Vietnam, we are uh, in uh, from the first of we in classification when it's checked, and after that we in we in collection and to storing uh, to uh, uh, and, and storing this one and that is a some uh, activity for the, uh, the number for the uh, activity classification collection and storing to divide to the central, provincial, and private district uh, healthcare facility in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. That is the activity for uh, plastic waste management in Vietnam. Next, please. For the plastic waste treatment in, to the, in Vietnam, we can see we have a divide for uh, treatment for infectious, uh, plastic waste for ordinary plastic waste and standard plastic waste, and uh, we have some uh, uh, some type of uh, treatment of uh, of plastic waste. Uh, for example, we can hearing an external treatment unit. We can use uh, some uh, high technology like wet microwave steaming. Uh, we can use uh, we can we can burning and cluster treatment. And, uh, and maybe uh, we can, uh, for standard plastic, we can sell it to other units. Uh, the, the standard of plastic waste may be the single use. Uh, for it, uh, it means that the, uh, the cup or something, the, some, something like this, we can sell, we can sell it to other, other unit. That is the, uh, the, the, the data for the treatment, plastic waste treatment in Vietnam healthcare facility. Uh, next, please. Uh, for during the uh, COVID-19 in 2000, uh, 2021, uh, we do the survey uh, in some, um, some, uh, some hospital in Vietnam. Uh, that is uh, some, uh, some general hospital in Hanoi, uh, in, Ho uh, in Bắc Ninh province, in Bắc Giang province, and for special, um, the uh, special, um, Hospital for only for treatment uh, for treatment uh, COVID nineteen is for Hải Dương uh, uh, for Hải Dương uh, for Hải Dương province, and we uh, also to find that the medical with uh, we also to uh, calculate and to uh, collect the data from the type of plastic waste kilogram per day for uh, medical waste. Uh, so infected plastic waste and the risk of containing uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, and the hazardous non-infectious waste and ordinary waste. You can see that is uh, some data for, for this one. And for, uh, for infected plastic waste, uh, you can see in some hospital, it's increasing uh, more than 150% uh, for in, uh, in COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, treatment. And the risk of containing SARS-CoV-2 is also to, to, rise, to, to rise up the number of uh, is rise up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, uh, we compare the plastic waste situation during COVID-19 in uh, healthcare facility and in the general. Uh, in COVID-19, the total uh, we can show, uh, we can we found that the total amount of plastic waste increased by 150 percent, and the uh, treatment uh, for this one we because very uh, special situation. So the treatment is uh, we only to hearing external treatment units. You can see in the uh, in the normal situation. Uh, we can, uh, for example, sell, sell, uh, sell treatment or uh, burning or something like this. But in the COVID-19, we have only to, to method for having uh, external uh, treatment units. So, uh, so the, if the total amount of the, uh, of the plastic waste increasing, uh, so the collecting is the puts the um, heavy demand uh, for collecting and storing this one. And also for financial uh, during COVID-19, the total amount of money paying for cheating uh, medical waste increasing to, to uh, 20 uh, times to compare for the, the, the normal situation. Mm. Next, please. 
Uh, yes. And uh, for the vaccination, because you know that up to uh, up to uh, the end of March of, uh, of this year, there are about two hundred million, uh, approximately uh, two hundred million doses of vaccine was injected for Vietnamese people. Vietnam become one of six countries getting the highest percentage vaccination. Uh, each dose of vaccine being uh, if compare, uh, we can we can we can compare that each each dose of vaccine being injected will discharge at least one shinger and one glove into the environment. The, throughout the process of vaccination from source to end of cons uh, consumption, a huge amount of solid waste, especially uh, plastic one, will be discharged in the environment without being cheated. That is a problem. We will to rise the, uh, the, this problem uh, during the uh, COVID-19. Yes, uh, especially for the uh, increasing the plastic waste. Next, please. Uh, Vietnam also have next. Okay, next, please. Vietnam have uh, uh, Vietnam also have. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know that some some slides missing some slides some slides and we we so that uh, in Vietnam we are have more than uh, 13, 13 uh, medical facility healthcare okay, facility which also give rise to many different types of uh, accident of accident the Ministry uh, of Health in Vietnam has issued directive number zero eight. That's July uh, 20, um, 29, uh, 2019, on reducing plastic waste in the healthcare facility. Um, and uh, Ministry of Health also to have a uh, plan uh, for, for on reducing plastic waste in the health sector. Uh, and we uh, have uh, many initiatives uh, for reducing the plastic waste in healthcare facility. For example, for replacing plastic bag, uh, plastic bag containing film and clothes with uh, paper bags, or uh, replacing the uh, replace the plastic medicine bag, uh, promote community um, communication through band on the website on the unit, uh, replace the blue farm container with reusable plastic one, or uh, replace the mica cover also file with the paper uh, cardboard. Uh, next, please. That is a uh, some picture about the uh, some uh, some activity for dealing with plastic waste and in healthcare facility. You can see we can replace the plastic bag with cloth bag, or use the paper to wash traditional medicine, or reuse plastic waste as the decor decoration or something like this. Like uh, next uh, next please, and we have uh, some uh, lesson and recommendation. Next please. Yeah, we have some uh, urgent lesson learned and recommendation for this in this uh, for this intuition. The plastic waste reducing should be important priority in relevant policies, which will be a legal platform for sectoral action. Uh, the national strategy, uh, strategy and action plan for climate change adaptation, national strategy for environment protection. COVID-19 waste management, including in healthcare facilities, should be integrated in any national and provincial COVID-19 response strategy and our plan. The third one is the strength uh, the treatment capacity of plastic waste, in particular, and infectious medical waste in general for hospital and external companies. The first is the medical plastic uh, waste uh, segregation has not done properly within healthcare facility in Vietnam due to the lack of detailed uh, instruction. It is necessary to develop the detailed instruction on medical plastic segregation, uh, segregation for healthcare fac facility to apply. Uh, the fifth is the minimum uh, no generation of plastic waste approach should be applied in healthcare facility, especially hospital at all levels. And the last one is the, uh, the last but not least, uh, financial and technical support for healthcare facility to improve and had to change treatment procedure of medical equipment more friendly with the environment. And 
uh, and uh, the last uh, that is uh, all of my presentation and thank you so much for your uh, listening yeah thank you thank you so much uh, yeah. dr uh, ha for yes. your uh, elaborated experience of uh, uh, the plastic waste uh, discharge from the healthcare facilities yes. uh, in Vietnam and how it uh, further harm our environment as well as impacting mm -hmm. on our in the climate. Uh, just to uh, proceed with the, uh, with the rest of the discussion this afternoon. Yes. If uh, there was already a mention a while ago from one of our panelists that vaccine hesitancy mm -hmm. is an issue that in a way uh, halt the uh, more effective coverage of uh, vaccines throughout the population. Uh, but even before vaccine hesitancy, climate change denial is also real. And how do they come together and how it yes. impacts on the efficacy of our health services and securing our own health. Uh, here to provide an elaboration uh, on this uh, topic uh, is, is Dr. Uh, Chimaila Mahmoud, uh, who is a medical uh, professional and with more than two decades experience managing crisis in health, uh, disasters and conflict settings. She is currently uh, the uh, executive director of the brand new uh, uh, Sunway Center for Planetary Health at Sunway University in Malaysia. She is currently a member of the Malaysian Climate Action Council and Consultative Council for Foreign Policy and Senior Fellow of the Adrian Arts Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Dr. Mahmoud is also the Pro Chancellor of Harriet Ward University in uh, Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Jemaila, thank you so much. Uh, please uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mon. And uh, thank you so much to the previous speakers who've really given me a lot of food for thought as well. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone uh, tuning in for wherever you are. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak on such an important uh, and critical subject. I hope that this event today will help trigger more conversations across all sectors. For me, the webinar comes at such an opportune time, just when I myself am racking my brain and those of my colleagues in trying to develop a connecting narrative, a story, which explains why much of what I have experienced in crisis and conflicts has led me to the vision that I'm now invested in, which is planetary health. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me from the outset share my firm belief that the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis are so critically and intrinsically linked. Both are driven by the same root cause, that is the ugly disruption to the health of this planet that we can miraculously call home. In my now rather many years as a doctor, I have seen a lot of epidemics and crises up close, but COVID-19 is by far the nastiest. It has shown and is still showing us that there are serious shortcomings in humanity's ability to prepare timely and effective collective prevention of potential health emergencies, clearly illustrated by our previous speakers, brought about not just by ignorance, but by our lack of humility and the sense that we had nature beat when quite clearly we didn't. Equally worrying is that our response capability remains even after or during this pandemic, woefully inadequate. For some of us, the pandemic was the first time that we've heard of zoonotic disease, where the virus is transmitted from animals to people. But we need to shout from the rooftops that pandemics are 75% zoonotic in origin. And the acceleration of zoonosis that we are seeing now is irrefutably due to human behavior. Our disdain, our lack of care for the environment, how we manage our waste, and the fact that animals and humans are forced to live in ever closer proximity as we encroach on the natural world 
In addition to the already frightening impacts that climate change is having on the animal world, means that the crossover of viruses between animals and us is on the up. Now, what do I mean by that planetary health? Next slide, please. We now live in the epoch of the Anthropocene where humanity, it's us, human beings, is the most powerful force shaping the future of the earth and in turn, dramatically impacting our individual and collective health. As the public health community started to wake up to this fact, so emerged the concept of planetary health. In a landmark report published in The Lancet in 2015, planetary health was described as the achievement of the highest attainable standard of health, well-being, and equity worldwide through judicious attention to the human systems, political, economic, and social that shape the future of humanity and the Earth's natural systems that define the safe environment limits within which we as humanity can flourish. In short, planetary health is the health of people and the planet on which we depend. The prevention and control of endemic infectious diseases like malaria and dengue, many of which are highly sensitive to the climate will be much more challenging if their upstream environmental drivers are not addressed. And the boundaries, as, as the boundaries between human and animal environments break down because of various human activities, such as wildlife trade, our region is becoming ever more exposed to, the, to triggering future pandemics. I hope that I have my first point very clear in that humanity is the driving force of the planet. Just in case it's not, let me be brutally frank. How many international climate related treaties and agreements have we had in the past decades? Year after year, we come out of big carbon generating conferences, feeling good about ourselves with a list of high level and often unimplementable promises for the next conference to revisit and revisit. But how much concrete progress have we actually made? Mind you, this has been going on for decades. No international treaties so far have put our individual consumption under a microscope. That is precisely what planetary health is all about. Behavioral change at the individual level. Until and unless we admit that both the climate crisis and the initial surfacing of the pandemic were down to an increasingly flawed economic, social and political model, which is primarily fueled by greed and which is causing frightening levels of planetary degradation, then there is an awful inevitability that we will become stuck in the same feedback loop of more pandemics, increased mortality and morbidity, and ever, gracing, ever greater risk to human health. Can we move to the next slide? The same behavioral as aspect was and is so clearly evident in our vaccination efforts. If I could reflect on my short stint as the Special Advisor on Public Health to the Prime Minister of Malaysia at the height of the pandemic last year, I truly wish that we had considered in advance how to better manage the environmental impact of our pandemic preparedness and crisis management frameworks. It was seeing all the clinical waste as so elo eloquently explained by our Vietnamese speaker, discarded masks and plastic takeaway bags that further solidified my commitment to planetary health. At the same time, I'm extremely proud to share that our government's introduction of a green vaccination program was in place where guidelines on clinical waste management procedures were incorporated together with cultivating green, practicing, green practices and reducing overall carbon emissions produced at vaccination centers and health facilities running the national COVID-19 immunization program. This move was urgently initiated after we discovered that the immunization program would lead to an additional 2,079 metric tons of clinical waste within just the first 12 months. Of course, like any policy, the challenge is in implementing what has been agreed. And for that to happen requires a commitment beyond just the ministries of environment and health. It is about every individual being enabled, empowered and sufficiently informed to make an effort. 
Working on Malaysia's vaccination program also meant that I had to face and deal with a lot of vaccine hesitancy up close. So much has been said about how climate deniers are akin to vaccine deniers. The irony is that while science has become more convincing, public opinion has become more divided. The gap is in communication. For so long, science has been packaged as something only those in the ivory towers could and should be able to understand. When the, when the, when the irony is that understanding how science works is a major key for making informed decisions. And in the context of the climate crisis, the urgency of these decisions and the need for them to be arrived at by every single person on the planet should not, indeed cannot, be lost on us. We move to the next slide. Meanwhile, obesity and other chronic non-communicable diseases are continuing to spread, largely influenced by a combination of people eating highly processed, generally cheap and un unhealthy food, pursuing unhealthy lifestyle choices as a result of the advent of technology that requires us to sit staring mindlessly at a screen, moving only our fingers and eyes, and definitely not moving our bodies, rapid urbanization and increased use of carbon fueled vehicles that re reduce physical activity while increasing greenhouse gas emissions. All this, of course, against the backdrop of the climate crisis that will lead to higher mortality levels in the coming decades. WHO has projected approximately 250,000 additional deaths globally per year between 2030 and 2050 from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, heat stress. A more recent study revealed that up to 83 million deaths are likely to occur until 2100 if climate change is not averted. So is it all doom and gloom now? That is certainly far from the message I would like to convey today. But I do want to stress urgency. There is no doubt that COVID-19 has disrupted our lives in previously unimaginable ways. But it's also shown a light that in spite of the problems that humanity has caused, it is also humanity that possesses the solutions. At the same time, let's not be naive and pretend that there are easy answers. We are in the realm of syndemics. Multiple crises from infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, what I'm starting to see as the diseases caused by big tech and climate impacts on health all colliding now. Next, please. Now, I'm aware that I'm speaking to some bankers and economists in, in this webinar today. So let me try to appeal to you in not just words, but numbers. Estimates vary, but the COVID bill in terms of economic losses thus far, and we're by no means at the end of this yet, stands at somewhere between USD 110 to 120 trillion, as cited by the IMF, the economists and others. That's 120% of global annual GDP. Six million people have lost their lives and 487 million infections and rising have been recorded. At the same time, it's estimated that an investment of approximately 20 to $50 billion annually could substantially reduce the likelihood of future pandemics. Now that's around 10% of the COVID-19 bill just in 2020. So how do we get political masters, policy policymakers, the private corporations and society to make those right investments in preparedness? When the evidence is clear, what would it take to get action going? So this much on the challenges. Let me now get to some potential solutions, models that we, we can look at, as well as lessons we learned from the global pandemic and the vaccination efforts that, that we can now apply in communicating science for planetary health against climate deniers. Can we go to the next slide? Perhaps some are already familiar or not, but central to the planetary health concept is also donut economics, a new model that proposes that economic development must operate within a safe and just space for humanity, in which there are no breaches of the ecological ceiling outside, no shortfalls below the basic social foundation or the inner ring for humanity, or more simply, the provision of life's essential services. 
So what I'm trying to say is we need to shift how we plan and implement development with conscious concern not to damage the planet. This needs to be drummed into the development world from politicians, private sector, the public. Avarice and greed will be the end of us. We need to wake up and recognize that urgency. So the donut economic model gives us um, and I, a chance, right? And I would implore the ADB and its partners to take time to understand what the team at Oxford are doing and consider adopting the model. I'm speaking to you today from Ipoh, a city north of our capital, which is planning to implement donut economics to follow the footsteps of Amsterdam in achieving a donut city status, the first in Asia. Next slide. Coming back to the core of this presentation and now understanding the similarity in the psyches of vaccine deniers and climate deniers, how do we shift focus and behaviors to addressing the climate crisis beyond just the COVID-19 pandemic? The first key lesson is that people should always be at the center of policies. Vaccines don't save, don't, don't save lives. Vaccinations in their arms do. Similarly, every green technical, technological breakthrough is useless in getting to a net zero carbon emission if it remains unutilized. This means inclusion of all communities at all levels because the risk of not engaging with local people is that through the resulting communication gaps, misinformation spreads and is amplified at a scary rapid speed through social media. In every crisis that I have encountered, it has proven critical to listen to and engage with communities, even those who you think are irrelevant because truly no one is. The second lesson is to build trust through trusted messengers. In the context of COVID-19, many governments suffered a huge public trust deficit. Malaysia, unfortunately, included. But what undoubtedly helped drive the National Immunization Program, which is really quite excellent, was working through respected individuals within local communities. Not just the political leadership that was strong from my health minister and healthcare professionals, but also religious leaders, village heads, celebrities, social media influencers, and so on. Recently, I spoke at a webinar together with a Malaysian celebrity guest speaker, Siti Norhaliza, Malaysia's possibly most successful singer. It was lighthearted and fun, even ending with a simple message of cities fans are great, don't litter and take care of the environment. The message is so simple, but well received. And in fact, we are receiving requests by the public to see more of her doing environmental advocacy. So we need to leverage on these key figures and influences to play a role in community, communicating climate change health risks while promoting small behavioral changes towards healthy and sustainable lifestyles. Lastly, in the same vein, humanize the data. More often than not, scientists and policymakers tend to give us dry lists of statistics, macro level aggregates, whatever those are, of how many people are affected, how many jobs lost, et cetera, et cetera. Yet behind these numbers are real people, people who have lost homes and families, but also people who consciously make the decision to willfully damage the longer term prospects of the planet for short term profits, trampling on the hopes and aspirations of ordinary people whose agency may admittedly be limited by the existing structure that profits rent seeking elites. I'm constantly reminded of the story of Rosamond Kissy Debra, whose nine-year-old daughter, Ella, died in 2030 because of air pollution-related asthma. Rosamond, a former teacher, is now a frontline advocate to end fossil fuel subsidies because both climate change and the air pollution that took her daughter's life are driven by fossil fuel burning. As I conclude, there is one more issue that I want to leave you to think about. I'm part way through reading a book written by Johan Hari called Stolen Focus, Why Can't You Pay Attention? If like me, you feel that your ability to focus over the last couple of decades has deteriorated, then you are not alone. Hari explains, 
that the advent of email, social media, and all of the tools that are now available to help us be more efficient and effective are in fact making our minds constantly switch between one task and the next and destroying our ability to focus on what's going on around us. How many of you has, have surreptitiously been checking your phones while I've been speaking? How much of what I've said have you actually heard? How much might you retain as you check your emails to make sure that your, your value is recognized because people are constantly sending you emails, looking at Twitter likes, which trigger a dopamine response in your brain, LinkedIn shares, Facebook feeds, apparently Facebook only for us over 40, TikTok videos and Insta hearts. I worry that we are now too distracted by technology to find the time to pay attention to the really big issues, that we are sleepwalking into a planetary health crisis where our distractions and our tech, in, tech formed and reinforced opinions will quite literally be the death of us, whether vaccine denial, climate change denial, COVID-19 conspiracy theories or whatever is coming next. And I don't mean to be preachy here. Those of you who know me know that I'm active on social media. But this book hit me squarely between the eyes and I'm now taking time to reflect on how I'm spending my tech time and the extent to which throwing my thoughts into the technology echo chamber is making a difference or not. At the same time, the reality is that people trust social media, use it as their primary news source and often don't check to see whether they are being fed, whatever they're being fed is true. So we must engage via social media but we need to be smart about it. Quite how, I don't exactly yet know, but I'm thinking about it. And I would love to hear from any of you about what you are doing or think might be helpful. I firmly believe we need to get the best minds together to help find a way out of this huge challenge we all face. I hope that what I have presented is useful and clear. The health of humanity and the planet are intertwined. Planetary health is about people. So let us make sure that this is our priority. Thank you very much. All right, can I be heard now? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Jemaila Ma'am. Such a reminder. Uh, to each one of us that we must begin to focus on the big thing and what really uh, matter. And uh, that social media has not worked yet towards that direction, but it still is the most popular way of reaching to uh, most number of people. Um, we will have time to do our uh, uh, open forum. Uh, I think uh, given that uh, we run uh, more time on some other speakers, perhaps we can allocate two or three questions from our uh, audience. But I already have two right here uh, in the chat. Uh, if I may raise this question to our panelists and uh, you can respond uh, from uh, Doc Glenn, uh, uh, Dr. 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 Ha, and then uh, Jamila now and Dr. Stuerman. They, uh, did you have a chance, this is from Hasint Musumam Watsa. Did you have a chance to compare the effect of COVID-19 vaccination and routine immunization program on climate? And what are the lessons learned and best practices from pandemic vaccination campaign that can be extended to the routine immunization in the climate change perspective. Okay. So this is a bit of moving it forward from vaccination campaign related to COVID to the routine vaccination or immunization uh, campaign and how uh, we should look at it from a uh, climate uh, perspective. Anyone, uh, uh, Dr. Glenn, are you still around? If, can we hear from you briefly uh, on this question? And can you turn on your uh, camera? Okay, uh, while waiting, uh, uh, either Dr. Thurman, Dr. Ha, or Dr. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, uh, 
anyone on the first question and you can see the question from the chat uh yourself uh okay doc Glenn, are you ready yeah i'm just looking at the chat again <laughs> yeah on the on the uh, q a chat yes check of uh, covid-19 vaccination and routine All right. <clears throat> are we answering Hyacinth first? Yes. Yes, we are. All right. Um, I guess, uh, as I was saying in my slide earlier, co the COVID-19 vaccination program is the biggest so far globally. Right? So uh, there are other infectious diseases which are being given vaccinations, but at a periodic time. Never has there been a, there have been a time like this COVID-19 vaccinations that we are simultaneously doing. Uh, this is because of the nature of the, of the infection. Wherein, you know, it's very fast. Infection and fatality is very fast. The spread is very fast. Mutation is very fast, so that we have to uh, act faster. And because of that, um, this has given us a, a challenge of um, resource mobilization and then producing the vaccines themselves and also distributing the vaccines and giving the shots. Now, while we're doing all of that, I think the the best lesson that we can look at is that as i was saying in the recommendation a global action on simultaneous and um, implementation and uh, cooperation <clears throat> from 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 production of vaccine to distribution uh, should happen that's one that's uh, i think the first lesson that we should look at in other words uh, we should not be you know acting alone or in um, uh, silos, but rather horizontally as much as vertically in order to look at resource mobilization. And uh, I'd like to give some you know, um, positive feedback to WHO. And uh, they have been doing a lot of this coordination and also Gavi, you know, uh, it's a program for giving vaccines uh, internationally. Uh, together with, uh, um, what do you call this? Bill, um, what's the name of this Belinda. guy? Uh -huh. uh, Bill Sorry? and Melinda Gates uh, Bill, Foundation. Yeah. The foundation, they've, they've been very uh, you know, helpful in making vaccines happen worldwide. So e equalizing the effect and the cost of the vaccine are two parts of the same coin, two phases, because you know the effects can only happen if we equalize. Uh, how, how, you know, s some countries can afford all of the vaccines, some cannot. And uh, cooperation and uh, sharing of resources is very important in making as a best practice. So coordination and sharing of resources are two of the very important things. Now, with the implementation with, uh, what do you call this, uh, um, cold chain, it's also very important for us to consider that technology even as we move forward, how do we preserve cold chains? And uh, uh, moving forward with uh, vaccination, uh, routine vaccinations, there are new types of vaccinations right now. Like in our, in our center right now at Mary Johnston, we are now looking at a new type of delivery of vaccine, which is a uh, nasal spray. So COVID-19 nasal spray vaccine is a, a clinical test that we're doing right now, clinical trial. And uh, you, new technologies of delivering vaccines should be considered even as we move from the pandemic vaccination program to a routine immunization because new types of delivery of vaccine will make it more accessible and it's going to be self-administered and uh, we'll need lesser of these technologies even as we share it with the developing countries. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, let's go quickly. Uh, there's another question in the chat uh, from uh, Sultan uh, Mahmoud. What are the feasible options on waste management at sub-district level where there is no incinerator or 
uh, autoclave. And may, probably this would be treated as the last uh, question as we're running out of time. Yeah, Dr. Uh, ha, your uh, hand is raised, please. Uh, um, I, uh, I would like to say something, my comment about the difference between the uh, vaccination in COVID-19 and the routine vaccination, okay. uh, as a vaccination. Because you can see uh, in Vietnam, now we have injected two doses and continue to uh, inject third dose and uh, the third and the fourth dose for the, some vulnerable group such as uh, weak immune system uh, underlying disease, the elderly. So the problem here is the first the routine vaccination. We use for uh, one dose for year, for, six, for example, at least one dose for years, uh, maybe to repeat dose for every year, but for uh, vaccine, uh, for COVID-19 vaccine, we can uh, use uh, three or four months, we have uh, one dose. So it's the rising up the, uh, the discharge of the syringe and the shaft's uh, waste for this one. Also, that is a problem for this one for increase, not only to double or 30 or 40, uh, about the amount of the Western, the medical Western for the vaccination. Uh, so um, that is uh, the, the key point for this one, very different. Yes, that is uh, my, uh, my comment for this one. Thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, ha. Uh, sorry that uh, we're uh, really running out of time. Uh, Dr. Zerman, if you care to read the, the question on the chat, there is one meant uh, for you uh, on the triple uh, uh, crisis or triple burden of pandemic, poverty, and, and climate change. Uh, but uh, since we are running out of time, I would wish that we can answer this by uh, email or uh, over the chat uh, itself. And uh, may we now move over to the uh, closing of the uh, program. We only had four speakers, but uh, it, it is as if we uh, tackled a lot. Uh, and we hope that uh, through our chair in uh, Healthcare Without Harm, uh, Southeast uh, Asia, Dr. Esperanza Cabral, who is also our former Philippine Secretary of Health. Uh, it's uh, a bit of the gist of the discussion will be uh, presented, as well as the uh, closing uh, remark uh, itself. And I'm honored to call Dr. Esperanza Cabral. Thank you very much, Mon. And greetings to all our esteemed panelists and participants at this secure webinar series number three entitled COVID-19 Vaccination Programs and Climate Change. This has been a very interesting conversation and indeed an engaging discussion on critical topics that unfortunately at this time, few acknowledge as interrelated issues the ongoing COVID-19 vaccination programs and climate change. From the inputs of our respected speakers, the linkages are clear. Even better, our panelists have localized the problems of vaccination and climate change and have provided recommendations on how we can move forward in each of their countries. This makes me feel confident that the concepts and insights shared in this webinar will not end in their presentation, but rather as we close today's program, the necessity of bringing health security through joint policies and programs that promote climate friendly, equitable access to vaccines and advocate for health justice will be put in the limelight across the ministries of health in our region. Let me cite key points raised by our speakers that presented linkages between vaccination and climate change. The first is the unmanaged pandemic waste, including vaccination-related waste, 
has adverse effects, not only on our environment, but also on human health. Plastic waste, mostly personal protective equipments, which constitute at least 50% of pandemic related medical waste is derived from petrochemicals and thus from the fossil fuel industry, which contributes about 90% of global carbon emission. Vaccine related gas, um, greenhouse gases emissions can be reduced with better cold chain logistics and production of supplies utilizing clean energy and the proper medical waste disposal. Health security is strengthened through both air and water quality, as well as good sanitation and waste management. Promoting environmental health will reduce vulnerability to disease and increase health resilience of the population. Pandemics and climate change disproportionately impact the vulnerable and marginalized communities, clearly increasing global health inequity. Pandemics and climate change increase interconnections across food, water, health, energy, and infrastructure systems, not always in a favorable way. Vaccination campaigns, if effectively and equitably done, enhance the adoption of capacity the adoption capacity of marginalized sectors. Reducing the burden of disease imposed by COVID-19 through vaccination can reduce healthcare carbon emission, thus enhancing its role as a climate mitigation and adaptation measure. Vaccine hesitancy and denial of climate change are threats to personal community and global health. Support for both vaccination and climate action is dependent on trust in science and requires effective communication strategies, among other things. From the speakers and our open discussion, important recommendations were drawn. Let me highlight the most relevant that we think can be taken forward from here on. First, is as COVID-19 vaccination accelerates, its environmental impact should be made part of sustainable vaccination planning that may include vaccine waste, especially plastic waste to be reduced, and sustainable pro procurement in healthcare should be utilized as strategy in reducing carbon emission and toxic waste from cold chain and other larger supply chains of vaccines. We should consider data science as a critical part of the solution as they generate insights to help decision makers make informed decisions and select implementation strategies based on efficiency and environment-friendly approaches in vaccine administration. Disease prevention and vaccine acceleration should be viewed as related climate actions where existing tools, such as those being used by healthcare without harm, for example, can be applied not only to measure toxicity, but more to promote action that reduce carbon emission. As we have seen, health security through climate-friendly COVID-19 vaccination programs can be further enhanced if taken from the broader perspective of promoting environmental health and addressing the health impact of climate change. To close, let me congratulate and thank our panelists and all of you for your active participation and important insights into this challenging issue of vaccination and climate. On behalf of Healthcare Without Harm Southeast Asia, may I also thank Asian Development Bank for initiating this webinar and entrusting our organization with the management of the event. Thank you and good afternoon.
Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Cabral, uh, Dr. Jemai Lamamu, Dr. Glenn Paraso, Dr. Lee Taiha. And uh, I think uh, we already uh, missing Dr. Suherman in the panel. And of course, our colleagues in the ATB. And most of all, uh, to the participants, to those who listen and tune in and after questions. We hope that we can move forward uh, from here on and we're able to answer some of the vital questions that we kick up, kick off at the beginning. Indeed, uh, uh, there's that vital link between the pandemic, the solution being provided for by the vaccination and how we address degradation of environmental health as well as uh, further destruction of our uh, climate. So thank you again uh, so much to all of you and uh, we say good afternoon or good night or good morning if you're on the other side of our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah.